All right. So welcome back to Making Action Happen. I'm Sarah Blackhurst. And I'm Brian McCain. And we have our good friend James Eklund, who is, I've referred to often as the Colorado's water Yoda. Um, he's a little bit uh, more than that, a little bit cooler, but not by much um, than, than Yoda is. Um, and he... <laughs> He does such a good job for our region and really educating some of our decision makers on water. But uh, years and years and years ago, my, one of my very first jobs is I was, I don't know if I ever told you this, James, but I was a, um, a legal assistant. And at one time, the lawyer I worked for said he was going to send me back um, to, you know, he was going to help pay for me to go to law school because he wanted me to get into water law. And then I looked at it a little bit and I was like, I don't think I'm tough enough for that. Um, I think if we want to go criminal law or something like that, we can talk, but I'm not tough enough for water law in Colorado. So, um, so welcome. I appreciate you doing the show today. Uh, you did a really great job at Colorado Cooperation. Oh, that was like what, a week or so ago. Um, we've lost track of time. Yeah. Um, and you are, you're getting ready to move cattle. I know. And so you're, you're in a library in, in Grand Junction. Um, yeah. as, as soon as you're done with us, you're going to go start, start, uh, moving your cows. So, um, I appreciate it. You being here and, and just hanging out with us for a little bit and explaining a little bit more why um when i talked with you i walked you out about a week ago i was fighting tears i'm like it's it's the end of the world on water Mm -hmm. um and then i immediately called brian i was like make me feel better and brian said (laughs) it's always the end of the world when it comes to water it (laughs) is it's been the end of the world for a while now and and because you had just said i don't i think we're we may be past the point of no return on this so would you start out by just kind of giving um our listeners a background on who you are and um, and your organization and how you got came to be, because I know that you even played basketball in Yakutat, Alaska at one point. So would you give a background a little bit on how you got to be where you're at today and what you're doing? You bet, Sarah. Well, it's great to be with you. And I'll try not to, you know, bore people to tears with my background, but uh, it, it, it spans the West. Let's just put it that way. So I, uh, I'm kind of fond of telling the story, so you'll just have to shut me up if I go too long. On You're that. great. We want to hear it. This, <laughs> it's a good one. I've heard parts of it. Awesome. Well, uh, well let me just start off by saying that um, the work that you guys do is uh, really critical to our democracy, and I'll tell you why I think that and why that might carry some weight here in a little bit. Um, but I am... Uh, convinced, having known you for a while now, that uh, you are definitely tough enough to be a water lawyer. So, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Not, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my story really starts. Uh, my family story starts in in the U.S. in 1888 when my great great grandparents homesteaded from Norway on the western slope of Colorado on the north side of Grand Mesa, to be specific, in Plateau Valley. And uh, that's where I'm going to be uh, headed off to move cows here in a little bit. Uh, but they uh, they came from a depressed Norway, uh, the economic depression that was kind of roaring through that country and through Europe at the time, uh, really provided the impetus for a lot of people to jump on steamships and make their way out to Ellis Island and immigrate into the United States. So, um, uh, yeah, my, my great, great grandparents, uh, Oli and Mary Gunderson, uh, made their move out here and they are, uh, just really, uh, the inspiration, uh, behind the work that we still do on an active cattle ranch. And uh, I, I like to think my family in that valley uh, continues that legacy on uh, as, as they do their work day in and day out. Um, I, as you alluded to, I, so my, my parents before uh, moving back to the ranch when my grandparents passed away, uh, they were adventurous school teachers and they ended up um, 
uh, m well, th they wanted to go where they could make some money, to be honest. And uh, Alaska was the highest paid salaries for teachers in uh, public education at the time. Oil and gas money was moving through there. Right. Like Great Alaska Pipeline had opened and all that. And so they looked at it and on paper it looked real good. So they moved up to the interior of Alaska, a town called Bethel on the Kuskokwim River, a river that would uh, just make you green with envy if you're uh, in a, <laughs> on a western river in, in the southwestern United States. Yes, it uh, but it, uh, it was a little extreme for them, a lot of permafrost, a lot of, uh, you know, really, really severe uh, temperatures, of, you know, eight, negative 80 with a wind chill. And they decided raising two young kids in that area, area was probably not the right idea. So they moved to a more temperate uh, location, uh, Yakutat, which is a Clinket Indian fishing village on the coast and it's more temperate uh, but it's a, a lot of rain more rain there than probably anywhere else in north america i think they get three uh, 200 inches of rain a year uh on average in yakutat and uh so it's irony of ironies or maybe it's the cosmos getting back at me uh for all that rain uh, <laughs> in my growing up uh and now i practice water law in southwestern united states and it's a uh, it's a pretty uh, stark contrast. It's uh, one extreme to the other. Um, so uh, I, I moved uh, around a bit when I was a, a kid. I've lived in every uh, major river basin in the state. Uh, I did a stint in Holly uh, out on the Eastern Plains oh, in, in, yeah. in Action 22 land. We know yeah. Holly and, well. Uh, yeah. Uh, Roy Romer's stomping grounds. And right. I, I uh, got to interview the governor when I was in elementary school and he visited his, his, uh, town and, and, uh, I got, I got to pretend to be a reporter for about five minutes, but, um, I, uh, uh, let's see over on the Western slope, a lot of work over there. Uh, I've, uh, done a ton of things, uh, in uh, state government. That's where most of my uh, professional career, uh, has been spent. Uh, I, I started out in the attorney general's office. Um, Ken Salazar, uh, huge influence. I, I like to think of myself as a bit of a Ken Salazar acolyte. Uh, and he advised me, he said, you know, James, you should get into water law. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, if you, if you get into that and you like it, then, you, you know, it, it's, it's a really interesting area of practice. So, uh, so I did that. And then the other thing he told me to do was if you ever get a chance to be a legal counsel to a governor, you should do that job. And uh -huh. uh, bringing up the great Roy Romer one more time here, I guess, uh, he did that job for Governor Romer. And then he said, if you're in state government, the third piece of advice was, well, you probably better get some managerial expertise if you can <laughs> under your belt. And uh, and so I did uh, that by moving over to the Colorado Water Conservation Board. I directed that agency for a number of years, and uh, we got the chance to put together the state's first water plan. And um, uh, it's a, kind of a, I don't know, hallmark of public policy a, a success if if instead of talking about whether or not it was a good idea to adopt that policy, uh, people talk about funding that. Right. Uh, I was going to say, fund it. now it's all and, about uh, the funding that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's good because we've, we've had a, a good, uh, a good run uh, with the initial version of the plan that came out in November of 2015. Um, I intentionally put it on a timeline that would make sure that it didn't uh, fall on the political calendar, uh, you know, when a Smart. governor or other statewide offices are up for re-election or election. And um, uh, unfortunately, it, that timeline has uh, seemed to slip since I left the CWCB. And yeah. it, indeed, the, the next iteration of the plan is supposed to come out on primary election day, oddly enough, June 28th uh, is when the new version of the water plant is supposed to come out. Huh. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, it, as you all know, and I think why you're having me on is water is apolitical. It doesn't matter if you're an R or a D or an I, it, it impacts you, you know, three days without it. And it doesn't matter what letters behind your name, you're, yep. you're going to, you're going to be in tough shape. So, uh, so, really tried to keep it out of 
the political football realm. Um, and I really hope, knock on wood, that that uh, is where it stays, even though, it, like I said, the calendar has slipped on right. us. So um, that, yeah, that brings you uh, almost all the way up. I was the representative on the Colorado River for the state of Colorado up until 2019. Uh, I got to sign the drought, drought contingency plan on behalf of Colorado. And the significance of that is that uh, it was the first time we as a seven basin state collective and the federal government and even the Republic of Mexico all agreed that we needed to do something or have a plan in place if the system continued to go south. And uh, I guess, spoiler alert, uh, that's what we're going to talk about, but yep. it, it's continued to go south and we've got to have, uh, you know, kind of an all hands on deck moment to meet that crisis. And, um, and leadership uh, is, is critical uh, in doing that. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about that. We absolutely are. So let me go back for just a second to the water plan. And, and um, when Brian was with uh, Scott Tipton, uh, he was involved in a lot of this. So he already knows um, intimately what we're talking about. Um, that being said, almost just about any time water is brought up outside uh, to me or anybody outside our office or outside our usual group, um, there's a huge gap in understanding compacts, water basins, um, who has the rights to what, where, and when, um, all of that. So can you, can you give us just a really quick, and I'm going to refer everybody, when we send this out, we're going to refer them back to um, the talk that you gave, the action talk that you gave at our annual meeting last year so that they can get a little bit deeper dive because that was kind of a 101 class on that. When we're back with James Eklund, we had a little bit of a um, some stuff going on. So we're just <laughs> continuing the conversation and James is so generous to, to come back and you're in Southern California right now. So you were in, so when we left you last week, you were, had gone over to uh, the Western slope and now you're in, in Southern California Are you fixing am. the water issues for California so that Colorado doesn't have to send our water over to them. Yeah. I wanted to see where it's all ending up and, and how, uh, how they're stewarding the resource. And, you know, there's some, there, there's obviously the, the bad stuff that goes on down here. It's the giant sucking sound that you hear from the lower basin that we talk about most often uh, because they just, uh, it's feeding the beast. They're a uh, vast majority of the 40 million people that rely on the river are down here in this part of the world. And, uh, and, you know, they're below the two largest reservoirs in the nation. So they, they have been able to, fairly consistently and reliably count on a certain amount of water every year yeah. that uh, they can, you know, get metered down to them. Whereas up in Colorado, we rely on our snowpack, right? So uh, it really depends year to year uh, whether or not we're going to be able to use anywhere close to what we're legally allowed to use down here. They've, they've, they, they can get really uh, right up against, the cap of how much they're allowed to use under the law. And over the years, uh, if you go back a few decades, they were using quite a bit more than their legal allotment. Uh, really? And, you know, they got, a re- they got away with that because we had surplus years. And, and you know, back when the river was fairly uh, healthy and robust, you know, nobody really cared. And, you know, that they, they, they had surplus guidelines. There still are surplus guidelines on the Colorado River that dictate how you divvy up when there's too much water for everybody. But uh, <laughs> when was the last uh, time that happened? Don't. Oh, yeah. It's those are those were the good old days for sure. Uh, and we we we're not we're not sniffing at surpluses anymore. So it's um uh you know I've actually I went into my my hotel bathroom and I I saw this uh. This little beauty. I don't know. I've this is seen all, those. Yep. Well, blurry, I think, on your end. But it says, help us conserve, conserve water. And then they have two big bullet points. They say, California is experiencing one of the most severe droughts on record with water resources at critically low levels. You can help save water by 
reusing your towels. Mm -hmm. So they want you to hang your towels up if you want to reuse them instead of throwing them in the tub and having them, you know, use the water to wash those towels all over again and reuse your, your sheets. So, um, you know, they don't, they don't change the linens on your sheets in your bed, uh, in, unless you tell them you specifically need that to happen. So, you know, those are small things that, um, that if you look at the scale of the amount of people that move through uh, a place like I'm in, uh, you know, I'm in Anaheim and near Disneyland and it's, uh, it's unreal how, how many people move through this park uh, every day. And uh, so these little things that you do in every single hotel room in this, uh, on the property uh, make a difference. And, and that's, I think, uh, you know, at the, at the individual user level, that's what we're going to need to see more of, um, because <laughs> the, you know, the, the agricultural sector and the rural parts of the Colorado river basin are, have already been trying their best to do more with less and sometimes more with nothing. <laughs> right. And, 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 you know, it, it's high time that, the municipal water sector, even though it's a very small part of the consumptive use, it it has to do its part because when you conserve water in agriculture, you're taking land out of production. And, you know, that's the difference. And when you conserve water in the municipal sector, well, you're taking a shorter shower or you're doing the things like I just read on this little uh, hanger, door hanger. But, um, but you, you know, you're not, you're not taking uh, a Pro, uh, the product off of the out of the equation essentially right the way you are in agriculture if you you know you can serve in, in agriculture that's that's what happens so um you know i think a lot of times people get the vocabulary screwed up a little bit when they're talking about this stuff and they think well if agriculture agriculture is 80 to 90 percent of the consumptive use in in uh in the west so that's where all of the efficiency should be uh, squeezed out of. And so if we make those systems more efficient, won't we end up with more water for the cities that we need? And, and the reality of that is, Sarah, that uh, that's not how it works in agriculture. In agriculture, if you get more efficient, you actually hit the root zone more effectively. And that means your plant isn't you know, supposed to uh, use more water, not less, when you hit the root zone really well. And so getting more efficient with um, infrared cameras on our center pivots and things like that, while that sound, that is good water stewardship and there are reasons we should incentivize that behavior, but it's not because it's going to save us a bunch of water. It's, it's going to actually probably end up consuming more water at, at the uh, plant level. So, you know, the, the, when you talk about efficiency versus conservation, sometimes people blur those together and, and, uh, and it can create some of the confusion that results in some of the legislation that I think we're going to end up talking about. <laughs> we are. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just for a little bit of a background, because I know this is super complicated and nobody knows anything about it, including the experts most of the time. Um, when, when you hear California say like, we're running out of water. Colorado owes us more water, you know, whatever it is. When was this agreement set up amongst the states and Colorado is a headwater state. So when, when did this get set into law? When was this laid out? Yeah, this goes all the way back to the, uh, to the early 1900s. We had uh, obviously, you know, like you said, Colorado, we were the headwater state, 18 downstream states in Mexico, sea water that starts in, in our snowpack. So, when we looked at a little river called the Laramie River that flows into Wyoming, uh, out of north, out of Colorado, uh, we we um, we thought, you know, that's a good that's a good river uh, for us to just take the entire flow and divert it into the South Platte, where where we were growing most of our crops and still do today. But what we what we uh, failed to recognize or I guess intentionally uh, overlooked was the fact that, well, there's some senior water users in Wyoming 
that used that water out of that river. And they weren't too happy about our idea of diverting the pretty much the whole flow of the river into the South Platte over the top of their priority, basically cutting the line and and uh, taking that water over. So they sued us. Wyoming sued Colorado and and. Uh, your listeners probably uh, know this or they've heard me whine about it before, but uh, suits between states go straight up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And under original jurisdiction, the Supreme Court took that case and they said, well, we heard the arguments that Wyoming and Colorado have made. And Colorado argues since they're the headwaters, they should get to use as much as they want. And Wyoming argues, no, we're senior. And that means that we should get our water before the junior diversion gets to gets to happen. And um, and so uh, but the, the court said, we agree with Wyoming on this one. If you've got two states that apply the doctrine of prior appropriation, we're going to apply that doctrine across state lines if there's a dispute. And and so uh, on the Laramie River, it wasn't the end of the world, but uh, we, we had a very uh, insightful uh, water lawyer named Delph Carpenter in Greeley who saw and argued that case um, in front of the court who looked down at the Colorado River system, which is essentially, you know, drains the entire western slope of Colorado, um, is, is part of the Colorado River system. And uh, he, he looked at that and he said, whoa, we can't have this doctrine that the Supreme Court just applied on the Laramie River apply to the Colorado River or, you know, we're, they're going to eat our lunch. They're going to have all the water down there in the lower basin and we're not going to have any uh, anything for our use up here and our growth that we anticipate, uh, you know, needing. So um, we signed a, an interstate compact in 1922 that gave us a different path forward. So rather than just looking at who has the most senior rights and newsflash, that would have been what's out my window here. Uh, that's Los Angeles, right? Uh, they're, they're, uh, they were growing a lot more quickly then, in fact, they were they had the Coliseum under construction in 1922 uh, for the Olympics. So they they were growing and growing fast and we weren't growing nearly as quickly. Uh, so they would have ended up with all the senior water rights down here. So you might ask yourself, well, why in the world would would the lower basin, the more senior water rights, why would they do an interstate compact? And the answer to that is because they ended up doing a uh a, a a lot of work on the on the Colorado River uh in in flood years they they uh they knew knew that the river was going to you know flood on occasion and that they needed to have a mechanism to control that that water and they also wanted to produce hydropower because LA was growing so quickly so they proposed Hoover Dam and uh, they needed support from they needed federal support because that dam's not in California. Yeah. Uh, so they needed support from Congress to to uh, essentially build that uh, that dam, and they needed uh, the other states to essentially consent. And the other states weren't really willing to do that if there wasn't some sort of certainty on how much water they got to use. So that's what drove the lower basin to the negotiating table. We were there because we didn't want the Laramie River experience to be replicated on the Colorado. And so that's what produced the Colorado River Compact in 1922. Uh, then Secretary of Commerce uh, Herbert Hoover ended up uh, uh, being the federal representative and chaired the meeting uh, that the meetings that um, were held to iron that out. Um, uh, no women at the table, uh, Sarah, no uh, people of color at that table, no American Indian tribes at that table. Uh, so there, there were some definite um, structural uh, weaknesses in the, in the document just inherently baked in because of who was at the table negotiating it, but it is a hundred years later now. Uh, so it's, it's exactly a hundred years, uh, in November when the compact was, was signed, uh, in 1922. And it, it, it's formed the, 
the bedrock, so to speak, of the system. And, you know, that that's been, it's for good or bad. Uh, it's been good uh, for the vast majority of that hundred year period of record. It's been it's been good. It's given certainty to the states as to how much water they can uh, rely on and grow into in Colorado's case. Um, it's given certainty to the lower basin states that had already built at, really kind of built out their demand. And it gave certainty to the federal government that needed that certainty in order to negotiate effectively with Mexico, not only on the Colorado River, but on the Rio Grande that is also covered by the same treaty that was signed in 1944 that probably wouldn't have been signed or even capable of being negotiated without that compact being in place. So the law of the river is, is, is a big, when you say the law of the river, you're alluding to all of the laws and regulations and policies that have grown up around uh, that compact that was signed in 1922. So it's very daunting. It's always been daunting for me as a water lawyer uh, in the West uh, to even contemplate uh, renegotiating that bedrock document, right? It was, mm. that, that would be essentially ripping the rug out from underneath everything else that it was that was built on it. But we're at a place now where even a person like me who's pretty uh, uh, predisposed, let's say, to uh, to shooting down any calls for renegotiating a compact, we're, we're at a place right now where the, the compact is not performing the way that it did when it was negotiated because the system is totally different than it was back when it was, when it was, you know, back in 1922. So it's a really long winded answer to your question, Brian. No, no, it, 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 uh, it, that's good. Because yeah, that, that's I, I don't the, think that's the foundation it. for what we've got. And it, it means that we've got uh, some very big challenges ahead of us, not just because the hydrology is different, but because the law and the infrastructure that we built was designed for a different reality than the one we're experiencing now. Yeah. Yeah. Not, like I said, it's good to have you explain that because I, I don't think anybody's aware of that or even how that works or how it started. So oh, they're not. That, that's what I wanted to get out. Like first thing, okay, this is what we're working with. Now we're going to. I have so many questions. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so which, and this is a, a really simple lawyer question. I'm going to say it's really simple. So when we have our um, elected officials and everybody else who's interested in water, um, who who takes precedent as far as the law goes? Is it the state or is it the federal government? So that's a great question. In in the, in the Colorado River again is instructive to in answering your question. So I'm going to go back to that. The Colorado River Compact negotiated in 1922 all the state signatories sign off uh, at bishop's lodge new mexico and we're off to the races right wrong arizona immediately goes we've got buyer's remorse we're not sure we like this deal that we just had our guy sign i think we might want something different and actually let's just interpret what we signed in a way that benefits us so they said immediately they said all right, well, whatever amount is our apportionment of this river, that doesn't include all the tributaries that come in from our state, does it? Because that's a different story. And we're assuming assuming that those tributaries are not considered part of the Colorado River system. We think that those should be something, uh, a, a class aside. We should get to basically use as much as we want out of our tributaries. And and also then get to move our apportionment out of the river, uh, the main stem of the river, uh, in, in excess of what we get on our tributaries. And California said, whoa, 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 that's not the way this works. We said the Colorado River system, we meant the whole damn thing, not just, you know, just just the uh, the main stem of the river. We meant all of it. And so if you have a... 2.8 million acre foot apportionment on this river, then 
if you use water out of the Gila or the uh, the Bill Williams River or the Little Colorado River, you're using water that is is going to be charged against your 2.8 million acre feet. You don't get that plus 2.8 million acre feet out of the river. Yeah. And so again, we've got conflict between two states, Arizona and California. Go straight up to the U.S. Supreme Court. What does the court say? The court says, Arizona, you're right. We think that you should get to use all your tributaries before you get before to you do that. I think yeah. of I think of that episode of Yellowstone when John Dutton <laughs> sends the guys up to. Um, he basically diverts the river his own because he owned it and he can divert it wherever he wants. And it completely, um, they were getting ready to do the, this big, uh, house or this big development, like right next to him. He's like, I'll fix yeah. this right now. And he yeah. went up there, but yep. it's the same concept, right? Yeah. It's a, it's the same yeah. concept that that's his river. And he went up with a few sticks of dynamite and diverted the river. So that's what we're going to do. And, yeah. and Arizona kind of did a version of that, not quite as violent, although they're, <laughs> they did dispatch some of their, um, their, their uh, military force to, to try and prevent California from building the diversion <laughs> structure that would take water over to where I'm sitting today. Right. And uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, I think, I think, uh, California does the same thing, but we make fun of Arizona for having a Navy uh, at that point because they put these troops on the water. And uh, right. and I think that's the definition of a Navy. Anyway, uh, I don't know the, what Brian would have to tell the, us that. The, the, the reason I tell that whole saga, that story is because one of the byproducts of that lawsuit was the federal government said, you guys are acting like children down here. You guys, you know, where's the adult in the room? <laughs> well, oh, oh, well, we'll, we'll, if you guys can't, you know, if you guys can't figure that out, we'll figure it we'll out. We'll put the adult in the room. We'll be the adult in the room. So the Supreme court said that the secretary of the interior is the water master in the lower basin because of that litigation. Well, Colorado and, and, uh, New Mexico and Utah and Wyoming, the upper basin states, we looked at that and we said, let's not do it that way. Yeah. Let's, that's terrifying. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and negotiate another compact. So we did in 1948, we signed the upper Colorado river basin compact. So, um, so we could avoid the litigation and the result that the lower basin, uh, got, which was, Oh, okay. Well, the, if you guys can't agree, then the feds are going to, you know, be the parent and come in and make the kids agree. And we, we decided, you know what, let's get this, let's, let's get this ironed out on our own so we can continue to be the responsible uh, adults that have water administration tied to the state. That's a state role in Colorado, in New Mexico, in Wyoming, in Utah, and it's one we jealously guard because we, you know, for uh, reasons that didn't exist in 1922 or even 1948, um, we wanted the ability to control our own resource and manage our own resource. And uh, in the 1970s, when we started seeing the environmental regulations that come from the federal government, uh, the National en Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act, um, we, we wanted uh, the, or we were happy, I guess, to say, is another way of putting it, that we had maintained uh, a state authority over administration of water. And so we, we've continued to insist on that being a part of any federal legislation, whether it's on the Colorado River or a different river in our state. We've always insisted that uh, that uh, deference to the states uh, be preserved and maintained. And so that's a really long-winded answer to your question, Sarah, but that's that's the answer is we control uh, in, in a lot of ways our own destiny in Colorado and the other upper basin states uh, by virtue of that, um, that, that attitude or that approach of doing another compact. But that had to be fiercely negotiated. So I remember... Um I think it was maybe two weeks ago, you and I were at the same conference and you were presenting and uh, Senator Larry, Larry Crowder got up and he said, um, 
And I don't know the rest of the question. I just remember that the air went out of the room when he talked about opening up the compact. And the people who knew what he was talking about, like, broke out into a sweat. The whole room just was like, <sighs> um, when he talks about opening up the compact. So will you talk a little I, In fact, I followed yeah. you out of the building because I was fighting tears um, when we started talking about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it. And and I'll just back up. Visceral reactions when it comes to water are to be expected. Mm -hmm. I mean, people like you guys, people like your listeners, they, they appreciate the issue and they, it can be frightening uh, when you start seeing some of the projections and some of the um, frankly inaction that we've uh, met this challenge with um, to, to date. And we can talk more about that. But the Colorado River Compact, like I said, is is the bedrock of the law of the river. And so a lot of people who have um, have, uh, you know, just taken for granted uh, that it's always going to be there and 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 have water rights that are associated with Colorado River Storage Project reservoirs like Blue Mesa, uh, you know, the, the Aspinall unit in, outside of Gunnison, uh, or the, you know, this isn't in Colorado, but uh, Flaming Gorge up on the border with Utah and Wyoming. Uh, there's the Navajo Project that's a huge reservoir down in the, uh, in the southwestern part of, it kind of backs up into Colorado, but it's mostly in New Mexico. Um, they, there are uh, people who have negotiated or contracted for water out of those reservoirs and but for those reservoirs, they're they're not going to have water to grow a crop, and so it does get to your you know you, you can get personal and and right down to what puts bread on and food on the table or your ability to grow food and put it on other people's tables. Uh, if if we start uh, questioning or reconfiguring some of the bedrock principles of the of the system, so. Your um, your reaction, Sarah, is uh, I, I'm you're not going to hear from me that that was inappropriate. I, I think it, it is it, it's scary stuff, and we should be meeting the challenge not with inaction or stepping back or pausing our our work, but we should be meeting it with bold uh, initiative and and really trying to figure out the path forward that puts us in the best position possible and puts those water users that have relied on that uh, system working, uh, it puts them in the best position possible. And it's not to say that we can avoid all pain. I mean, that's, that's not, that's not the case. We we're going to have, there's going to be pain associated with a system that is, uh, is failing. Uh, But how we deal with that pain, how we apportion it out, how we, uh, you know, how we deal with that crisis and really what are the opportunities that it presents? Well, one of the opportunities is it's been a giant wake up call to the part of the country that I'm in right now, which is the lower basin. And uh, the, the, the wake up call is that holy, wait a minute, we, we can't take these reservoirs for granted anymore. These largest reservoirs in our nation that we have relied on to meter out exactly how much we need every year, they're compromised. And uh, we, we've got we've to figure out a, a way to work with everybody else on this river. We can't just say we're going to use as much as we damn well please. And if you don't like that, you know, we'll see you in court. Uh, the river's not yielding that much. And so, um, so you know, one of the opportunities here is a, a different mindset, a different perspective from the lower basin. And, but that has to be met with a, a willingness to talk from the upper basin. The upper basin needs to say, hey, we understand that you're in a world of hurt and that you've got, you know, let's just be honest, the vast majority of the economic uh, benefit of the generation, the GDP of the West is in the lower basin, not the upper basin. And so we've got to figure this out together or, you know, our ability to market our products as uh, small as they may be uh, is going to take a hit 
if your economy craters because there's no water in your part of the world. Just the same way, and these are the same talking points that you probably heard from me when when I was doing the water plan uh, over on the Western Slope. I'd say, hey, listen, you know, we, it, it's fun sometimes to bash the Front Range and uh, say how terrible and ugly and mean they are and how they don't deserve the water and how many golf courses they have and that kind of thing. But you're not going to have an economic recession that happens on the front range that doesn't impact the Western slope. That's just, that doesn't exist. Uh, in fact, if there's a recession in our state, it's usually the rural parts of the state that take the longest to make it, make their way back from that recession. And we're seeing inflation right now, Sarah and Brian, that, that is, uh, it's scary. Uh, the price you're paying at the pump in terms of gas, those are, those are real impacts, and those economic uh, forces oftentimes last longer uh, in the rural parts of our state, and, and you know, we, we don't recover as quickly uh, there as, as some of the municipal areas do. So all that's to say that the, you know, the water issues that we confront we really need to be looking at the entire chessboard. We can't just be looking at one or two lines on it because we've got way too much invested in the economic connectivity of the basin and with in our state, the Front Range and the Western Slope. There, there's way too much connectivity there for us to, as a state to not be leading on this. Right. And I'll just be clear, over the history of this compact, over the last hundred years, starting with the compact and Delft Carpenter, we have been leading. We've been the state that has been at those negotiating tables with solutions. Here's how we do this deal. And and I was lucky enough to be at that table in 2019 when we did the contingency plans for if this system continued to go south and that we're using those right now. But we're not going to make it to 2026, which is what our deadline was going to be, um, without having to get back in and negotiate a different uh, way of managing the system. Because even with the 2019 contingency plan, we are seeing the system drop uh, rapidly. Right. So Powell and Mead are sniffing at their um, – Power, what we call minimum power pool, and minimum power pool is a, is significant because not only does that that mean the level at which uh, you, if you drop below minimum power pool, you can't generate electricity at either of the units, either Lake uh, Mead or Lake Powell, and so that means that. Uh, rural electric associations will end up paying a lot more money uh, for spot market power that they have to purchase off of that spot market. And that's expensive load following power that um, uh, I don't think any of them really can afford or really want to pass on to their rate payers, which is what they'll have to do if they, if they confront that. Uh, but it also means that the sale of that power goes to benefit a bunch of programs that are in place on the western side of Colorado and throughout the basin, really, especially the upper basin, where we take salt out of the river so that the Mexican government doesn't end up uh, uh, fighting with us over the quality of the water that they receive under the treaty that I alluded to. And the other program that we have funded through the sale of that power is the Endangered Species Recovery Program in the Upper Basin. So uh, that's the NEPA compliance that allows development on the river to happen at all. So if we don't fund those two things because we're no longer producing electricity at those reservoirs, that's uh, a suite of dominoes that I think is very misunderstood or not understood by a lot of people. And uh, it, it also means that we can't really move much water out of the reservoirs and certainly not the volumes that the lower basin needs to maintain their economic productivity. So it means <laughs> all this, all this uh, uh, going on and on for me means that we as a state, uh, Colorado, needs to be in a leadership position on this stuff. 
And right now we have uh, signaled that I think the vocabulary we used was we're taking a hard pause uh, on discussions around demand management. So before I get into demand management, I'm going to take yeah. a breath and see if you guys, uh, where you want to go next or what question uh, <laughs> comes to mind. So I have a couple. Do you have a couple? Yes. No, no, okay. So I will. I, I know this. Is, yeah, you will. Um, and I know you know this. And this is a totally, this is a, this is a tributary um, pun intended on this. I discovered this this weekend um, when we were with our uh, ag friends um, at Carl Farm Bureau. Um, I did not know this was a thing and this was a thing because we hear so often that ag producers, food producers, um, they, they just, they're, they're the biggest part of the problem with regard to water use. I was really shocked to find that um, consumptive use um, what they're allowed to use is based on what they've used in the past and not based on any efficiencies. So it's it's counterproductive to to the use of efficiencies. Just really quick, would you dive into that and why that is sure. the way it is? That was bizarre yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. So we we sit here and go, we we need people to conserve water. Everybody agrees with that. If if I'm talking about uh, here in my hotel room or at my house, uh, that conservation means taking shorter showers, turning the water off when I'm brushing my teeth, all that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe using a less water, maybe just using my sprinkler three times a week as opposed to five or seven. Um, you know, those are, those are things I can do to conserve water that stays in the system and goes, you know, to a, a, another use. Um, in agriculture, if the way it works is if you have a water right, which we have, and I'll, let me just back up because that's an important point. There are water rights in our system in Colorado. A lot of people, like if you go down 16th Street Mall and you pulled everybody down there, if you pulled 100 people on the mall and you said, hey, do you think that the private, uh, there should be private water rights in Colorado? I bet you you'd have 80, 90% people saying, no, 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 that's not what we shouldn't have private water rights in Colorado. That should be a public resource. Everybody has to have it, don't they? So that should be, you know, that should be administrated um, uh, by, by a government agency. Right. There should be, you know, a district or the state itself that should say who gets to use water. Isn't that the way we have it? I mean, when you explain to them, actually, no, that's not the way it works. We've had since before statehood a system of of private property rights uh, that essentially allow a farmer or a rancher or a municipality, a, a holder of those water rights, they can buy them, they can sell them, they can lease them. And they are a asset class that is uh, treated as, in some instances, it can be treated as a 401k for a, for right. a, a farmer or rancher who wants to retire and maybe their kids aren't coming back to farm or ranch anymore. Um, it can be used as a, uh, a leasing asset uh, so that you can make some potentially some money on the, uh, the path forward with the, uh, the, the uh, future generations that might rely on on water in a in a different in a, in a certain uh, uh, operation. It, it there there are there are ways to leverage your water rights in in a way that make uh, it work. So um, that there are a lot of people who don't understand that, yeah. and they think well. It's like air. It should just be, you have to have air to live. So, you know, we don't have private rights to air. So, you know, water, sh water, doesn't water work like air? Right. And w when they, when they, when, when they, when they learn that, no, that's not how it works. It actually, it's, it is a private, uh, right. And, um, you know, but it's that, pretty that highly system. regulated, right? I mean, it's pretty highly, highly regulated. regulated, right? So that's but the way, and, and the, yeah, your question is, well, well, how do, how's the consumptive use determined on an ag rate? Well, the, the, the value of your water right is not how much you divert. It's how much you use, how much you consume. Right. So if I take 
three cubic feet per second of water, which is a flow rate. Right. Um, and I take that out of the out of the river and I put it on my crops. And let's say the crops and evaporation use two of the three cubic feet per second and one cubic foot per second goes back into the river, then my water right is not three cubic feet per second. My water right is two two, Mm -hmm. uh, cubic feet per second. And that one cubic foot per second that goes back into the river is, doesn't belong. I don't have a right to that water. I only have a right to the amount of water that I consume. So the way the state determines that and the way it administers a water right is by looking at yes diversion records because they want to know how much you pulled off the river but they also want to measure the return flows that go back into the river right so that they can determine with some sort of accuracy how much water you actually have a right to use or lease or sell right and if you don't know that number then it can be very difficult to not injure the river. Let's just say I sell my water to a different user on the system or in a different basin or whatever. If I do that, then I only should be using, I should only be removing the water that I consumed. Because if I remove the entire three CFS, all of my diversion, now I'm hurting the river because that means that one CFS that was normally hitting the river with my return flows, that's no longer showing up. Right. So somebody that's, you know, g- even junior to me is injured because I have Used- essentially changed the nature of the river with my, with my, uh, my lease or my sale of water uh, outside of that, that river. So that's, that's kind of the, where, where um, the, the difference between conservation in the, in the municipal context where I take shorter showers and more water shows up in the river versus efficiency in the agricultural sector. If, if I'm more efficient with my water use, this goes back to my comment about the root zone. If I'm hitting the root zone more efficient, efficiently because I'm using drip or, or sprinklers or gated pipe or whatever, uh, then my consumptive use is going to go up because the root is going to grab more of that water as opposed to letting it go by. Like if I flood irrigate my field, then a lot more of that water goes below the root or uh, on the surface over the plant, but doesn't hit the root zone efficiently. And so that flood irrigation is going to produce more return flows at the river. And, and my water rate's not going to be quite as robust because, or as big because I'm not consuming as much water. So in a, that, that's, that's a, 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 a misunderstanding that I think a, a lot of people have is that they think if, if agriculture gets more efficient, it will result in more water being in the river. And it's the opposite. Right. It's counterintuitive. So, um, and I asked you that question because I want to get into two more things. We could probably talk to you for, you know, the rest of the day on this. But I, I asked you that because I, th- I think it's interesting uh, that people know how heavily this is regulated. The system that you talked about isn't always necessarily set up. That was set up 100 years ago isn't necessarily what we're talking about today because there's a lot of, there's a lot of ag producers that have created efficiencies. But they've, they've in, in essence, in some ways, been... Um, penalized for those efficiencies because they've lost some of their use rights. So that consumptive use right um, gets pulled back. And so, you know, you have some people that are looking, some ag producers that will look at it and say, well, I'd rather not install these efficiencies because if I need more water later on or whatever, there is almost a way of sort of banking it. So I'm not saying that that's what happens, but I'm saying you could, if you're looking at, and you say it yourself that they're the best businessmen around are ag producers, then that's an issue. So I want to talk about, that leads into the um, prior appropriations versus public trust um, issue. And in particular, I want to visit a little bit about Senate Bill 29 that um, that dropped this last session, which was a 
um, which was a water speculation bill. And I think everything that went around that was really, we're talking about the intent of the mm. user. Um, but uh, so can you, can you give us a quick appropriation, uh, prior appropriation versus public trust? Um, cause those are the terms, right? Yeah. That, yep. we're, that we use. Yeah, that's true. So private, uh, I, I, sorry, uh, prior appropriation is kind of what we've been talking about for, uh, well, since before statehood. Uh, and the, the, the law, the water law that we inherited from the British common law was the riparian doctrine. And that meant that you had to own land by the river if you wanted to use the river. And we came out west here and we had miners that were up in the you know, mountains up in the middle of nowhere with no access to a river. They, they, they were, they owned claims that had no water on them or near them. And they, they needed to get water to their sluice boxes and to their production facility. And uh, we, we were like, well, this riparian system doesn't really work here uh, because we can't expect them to go all, all run down to the river and buy water and then pipe it all the way up there we need them to be able to essentially own own water uh, own a right to use the water in a way that doesn't make them have to own the land right next to the river so that's the so we created this doctrine of prior appropriation to replace the riparian doctrine that the common law the british common law had uh, in place so when we adopted that we we created a different path forward that allowed us to uh, have private water rights that could be owned, uh, like I said, bought, sold, or leased, uh, just like real estate. And we uh, allowed that to uh, be severed from the land in certain instances. Uh, in some instances, it can't be severed from the land, like a federal irrigation project. Um, and I'll get back to why that's important here in just a second, but um, it, it can't be moved uh, in certain instances, but for the vast majority of water rights in Colorado, you can sever it from the land and sell it to somebody else. And that's how some of our bigger cities have, have, uh, have gotten their water. They've bought it uh, in places that it, it wasn't uh, as, as valued and wasn't, wasn't as productive to use it uh, there and they've transferred it to where they need to put it into taps and where it can be more productive. Um, how you do that is really important. That's a different conversation, but essentially, you know, you can't just take the water off the land and then just dry the land and then the wind blows and there's nothing to hold the soil down and you get Crowley County. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of effects. Right. Um, instead, what you want to do is put a cover crop in. And that's what most of the municipalities, I think the ones that I'm aware of, all planted cover crops after they moved the water off of the land. But then some people went out there and bought the surface rights without any water and tried their hand at dry land farming. And they, and, and when they planted their seeds, they, you know, tilled this disc, disc up the land and then planted. And then when it didn't rain, well, and then the wind blew and, and then all that, you know, all that cover crop wasn't there to hold the, the, the soil down. So in any event, that's the, uh, uh, doctrine of prior appropriation is, uh, the system that we have that allows for private water rights to exist. Right. right? And people have, you know, they've, they've put their water rights up as collateral at the bank. Sometimes like th th these are, these are a, an asset that you can't just snap your fingers and say, well, we don't like that way of doing it anymore. We're going to do something different because you're impacting somebody's private property. And in, in the United States of America, when you do that, when you take somebody's private property, that's called the taking and you have to pay, the government has to pay fair market value for that uh, taking. You can't just take it. This isn't this isn't an authoritarian state where you can do that. So uh, thankfully, <laughs> um, the the folks that I alluded to down on the 16th Street Mall that would say, well, water shouldn't be able to be privately owned. They're not bad people. They're just saying what they think the the situation is. They think 
you know, that, that's, that's, they, they, they don't know about these private property rights until you tell them. And then they usually go, oh, okay, well, I don't want anybody messing with my house. So I'm not going to, you know, I guess I don't want uh, those same people messing with other people's water that they own or the water rights that they own. So that, that dynamic, um, however, because they don't know any better, sometimes gets people uh, talking about a different, a, a replacement of prior appropriation. They say, okay, we, we, even if we understand prior appropriation, we don't like it because we think that, you know, there's a government agency somewhere that would be better positioned to make the efficiencies work and make the, the water go to the highest use, basically the highest and best use. And um, that's not farmers and ranchers. We think that's some government official, you know, that should be making that call. So, and, and they should do it in trust. They should hold that water in trust for the people of the state. Uh, those, those, that right to use the water should be held in trust and it should be a public trust. And uh, that should be how we administer water in, in Colorado. And, and that, that, that argument is, you know, essentially the public trust doctrine, which says, okay, instead of having private entities own this, uh, you can just, just think of it just like real estate. What if the government, what if we said, okay, it's been good, but people are messy and they're ignorant and they're slobs and we don't like the way that they're managing their real estate. We don't like that, you know, they, they put in chain link fences or whatever. We don't like the way that people are managing their land, their property, their, their, their real estate. And, um, and so we're going to do, we're, we're going to hold the land in trust for the people and that will allow us to kind of call the shots on who gets to put a chain link fence up and when and where and how. And, and, uh, and we're going to say who gets to buy and sell it and lease it. And, you know, it, it starts to sound a lot like a socialist regime. That's what it is. Right. Uh, so the, the, the public trust doctrine is just from a, you know, raw political science perspective is a move toward more of a socialist type of setup than a uh, capitalist structure, which is what we have right now. So my argument is, and I say this to the classes I teach at CU and DU, is that it's fine to have those arguments and those debates in an academic setting, like the one you witnessed at the Farm Bureau. That's fine to, to talk about the pros and the cons. But it is not fair and it is not a good use of time for us to debate those two regimes in a inauthentic way. You have to be uh, you have to be authentic. You have to be truthful about about the reality. And that is you can't get from point A, which is prior appropriation to point B, which is the public trust doctrine without paying fair market value for the property that you're taking to create the public trust doctrine. The people that own water rights have to be paid for that, that taking or it's unconstitutional. So my argument about all of this, uh, Sarah, and we can get to that uh, Senate bill 29 here in a second, but the, my, my argument is, Number one, the prior appropriation system has worked well. It is based in the capitalist democracy reality that we have in this country. And so it will continue to work well if we let the markets do their job in a regulated way. I'm not saying we should have a free for all. It shouldn't be an unregulated market, but we shouldn't move this entire uh, water asset class, private property asset class to a public trust doctrine that would essentially put a centralized government in control of the resource as opposed to private, uh, private citizens. That that's my argument. Uh, good people, people I respect and admire 
take the opposite view and that's fine. But my message always, every time is what I just said to you guys. And that is, it's fine to disagree, but you have to be uh, eyes wide open and clear with people, honest with people that if you move to the public trust doctrine, here's what it's going to cost. It's going to cost a significant amount because fair market value for water in the West is very, uh, it's very high right now. I mean, that that's, and it's not going to go lower anytime soon. At least that's my crystal ball. But that that's my argument is that it, we're better off with the prior appropriation doctrine. If you disagree with me, that's fine. But you still have to pay fair market value if you want to do something different. So interestingly enough, about six years ago, the federal government tried to do something similar like that in that they were holding up permits and asking like, grazing permits or ski resorts saying like, well, you know, if you sign over your water rights, we'll give you this permit. And, and and it was really funny because they, the forest service and BLM both were like, well, you know, you could still use your water rights. We're just going to manage them. But again, once you give that up, they can do whatever they want with it from that point on. But it it was kind of, it it was funny to see that it was almost like they were testing the waters for something federal similar like this. So, and I guess that is, that leads up to um, Senate Bill 29. So there was an interim committee that was discussing this exact thing. Um, and it was about intent and it was about, you know, the value of water. Because um, my question on all of that was, even though um, it's a private, like that use is private, um, it's so heavily regulated, we're all the way up to that line between, I mean, Anything else would be that line, and this is just in my mind. I'm not putting, trying to put words in anybody else's mouth, but now I'm going to put words in, in somebody else's mouth. So this interim committee got together, and they talked about all these different solutions, and we heard, and remind me of her name, the colleague that you spoke with um, from the state. Um, uh, oh, uh, called, Tracy Kosloff. Yeah, she was, she was talking about some of the solutions that they talked about, and she was on that interim committee. You were on that interim committee, correct? I wasn't. I oh. wasn't on that committee. Okay, there was a lot of, there's a lot of our members and people that we know that were, but yep. they said, do nothing. The way it is, it's all the way up to the line um, of between, um, so there's no more, there's, to do anything else would cause a tremendous amount of damage, I think is what they finally said. But it was basically uh, prior appropriations has been working. There are some things that we need to tweak, but we're all the way up to that line between it being public trust and prior appropriations do nothing. And yet Senate Bill 29 was introduced. So talk Correct. a little bit about that. Yeah. So let me straighten out some of the vocabulary just a little bit here. So okay, thank you. The interim committee – it, when we say interim committee in the water world, we're talking about one of the special committees in the legislature that meets when the session concludes. So right. Colorado legislature meets every year for 120 days. And then when they're done, there are issues that are so pervasive and they don't stop when the legislature stops. So they, the legislature has said, hey, when it comes to the, the, the budget, uh, when it comes to uh, things like healthcare, when it comes to things like education, water, uh, we need committees that meet all year round. Right. And we, we, that's why we call them interim committees because they're meeting in the interim between the session ending and the next session starting. Right. So those Thank are the interim you. committees. You're absolutely right. So the interim committee put together a uh, piece of legislation. They were, th- this all boils down to uh, Sarah and Brian, uh, a desire to control the asset, right? So yeah. they, somebody wants to control the asset. So they say, well, here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to run a bill that allows us more control over the asset or at least allows us to say no to other people controlling the asset. So that's what they did here. And uh, the initial reaction, this was a couple of years ago, uh, to that concept being on bill paper um, was, no, 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 you're going to have to have a lot of conversation before you mess with the private property of somebody else. So right. uh, go have those conversations first. So the legislature 
to their credit, put together a mechanism to do that. And it was a task force. Uh, it's kind of like a blue ribbon panel of really smart people. And uh, yeah, they didn't want me bringing the IQ level down in that uh, task force. So I was not part <laughs> of it. But, they, but there but there were really smart people, water lawyers, there were municipal water providers represented, there were uh, two farmers, I think there should have been more people from rural uh, Colorado on that on that committee, on that task force. But uh, they, they at least had two, uh, Joe Frank and Joe Bernal, uh, from one from the Eastern Plains and one from the Western Slope. And, um, and they got them together and they said, please put together a list of ideas that would allow us to strengthen the anti-speculation doctrine that the state has. Now, what is that? Well, this, the anti-speculation doctrine is this. It says, basically, you can't hoard water. You can't just go lock up a whole river and file a bunch of conditional water rates and then and then run around and try and sell those for a bunch of money. You right. can't, that, that's not allowed under our water law. We don't want that to be the case, which I completely agree with. And I think most people agree with that. Um, that's been the law for a long, long time, and it's enshrined in statute. Uh, so it's part of our our Colorado Revised Statutes. the the uh, The directive to the task force was go find ways to make that more strong or make it more restrictive, so that um, you know maybe not only shouldn't you be able to hoard water. But maybe if you're not from Colorado, maybe you shouldn't get to own water in Colorado. Or maybe if you haven't uh, identified the use that we think is the best use, maybe we should be able to, you know, we're starting to, you're starting to edge closer and closer to that public trust doctrine area where instead of the private asset holder calling the shots and controlling the asset, it's some centralized government that's doing it, right? So that's, that they said, hey, we want ideas. And so you task force, you go put your heads together. And they met for over a year and had meetings talking about this, uh, ways to make this this uh, doctrine more strong, more robust. And they put a bunch of stuff on paper and they thought, well, maybe we don't want to put a report out because we don't have any, we can't make any recommendations here. We don't like any of these ideas. Um we were told to go address a problem and we don't think it's a problem. In fact, we think it'd be a problem to mess with the system as we have it uh, defined now. So um, that meant that the report, when it came out, uh, it said exactly what you said, Sarah. It said, we are not making any recommendations to the legislature. And in fact, if you decide to legislate in this space, on this topic, you should have a lot more conversations with a lot more people and stakeholders than just the task force that we were on. So, or, you know, I'm, I wasn't on it, but I'm speaking as if uh, right, right. And I were on Because you read the report. Read the report. So the report said exactly what you said it said. Uh, and uh, it was presented to the legislative committee it was presented to that interim committee up in Steamboat at the Water Congress Summer Conference. Mm -hmm. And they said, in fact, Peggy Montano, who's a, a very respected, for good reason, water lawyer in Colorado, uh, said uh, she, she was one of the presenters of the report to the committee. She said, I'm going to set up a swear jar. And anytime you guys say the word recommendation, <laughs> you have to put a dollar in the swear jar and everybody got a good chuckle out of it. But the chairwoman, uh, Senator uh, Donovan and uh, and the ranking member, I think, was uh, uh, Senator Don Quorum. They both decided, you know what? We're going to keep calling him recommendations because we really want to do something. We want to run legislation is what is what they were getting at. And so they used the term uh, a couple of different times and there was recording of this meeting. So you can, you know, don't right. take my word for it. You can listen to the meeting and Peggy to her credit, every time they said the word recommendations, she said, uh, 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 there are no recommendations here. 
we as a committee did not endorse a single thing. In fact, the only thing we could agree on was that if you want to do anything in this space, you better have more, more conversations. conversations. So one would think that in our representative democracy, Sarah and Brian, that that would be enough for the uh, interim committee of any legislature uh, to stand down and uh, maybe do more outreach and have more conversation, but don't put something on bill paper. Um, well, that's exactly what our interim committee did. They put, they drafted up a bill. The bill would have assessed a $10,000 fine if you were uh, to violate it. And how would you violate it? Well, that would be up to the state engineer to put on his Sherlock Holmes hat and go out and determine what your intent is or was or will be when you transact with your water right. Because if your intent was to make a profit, then that would contradict the law and you would be assessed that $10,000 fine. Well, so if how I'm, would the state engineer know to go ask you about your intent? intent. Well, any neighbor, any, any citizen in Colorado could turn you in. They could say, oh, Sarah bought that 10 acres next door and, and she's she gonna looks have like she's farming right now, but she might, she might be ready to flip that. She might be willing to sell it next year. What happens to Sarah if, if she sells that land and that water and she makes a profit on it? the next year because maybe she decides that nah, this wasn't what I wanted to do, or maybe I want to do something somewhere else or a different sector, or I wanted to grow a different crop in a different area, right. whatever the reason, if you made a profit and you intended to make a profit, you would have violated this law that would have been, how dare uh, you make a profit law in place. Yeah. yeah. You would have, you would have, you would have made a profit and you would have been penalized for that. In, in an amount that uh, might have been a bit of a, a pain, but it was probably more of an insult than anything else. The, 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 the problems with that are manifold. They're all over the place. Uh, it, not only does it smack of a public trust type of setup, but it also means that we are not, it's insulting to agricultural operators. Like you said, and I, I have said it in the past and I believe it today is the smartest people I know are in production agriculture. And the reason they're smart is because these are razor thin margins you're usually operating with. And the market's going like this, like a roller coaster all the time. And so it's hard to make a profit. It's hard to stay in business. I know smart people who haven't been able to make it work uh, in agriculture. And uh, so to, to, to say that, well, we don't, we don't trust these people to make this good decisions on about their asset. We need the government to make those decisions for them. And we need to make sure that they're, heaven forbid, if they're in agriculture, they shouldn't be in it to make a profit. They should, you know, they can only be in agriculture if they're there for the right reasons, if they're there because of the lifestyle and the the you know the way of life and the you know the zeitgeist <laughs> that uh that is around rural uh agricultural production if they're in it for that reason we'll let them do it but if they're in it because they want to make a profit no 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 we're, we're not going to allow that and that's the problem uh that i had with the legislation is that as proposed as drafted it would have uh essentially uh put people um, that are trying to make a business run uh, in a very difficult position where they couldn't make a profit, which is ridiculous. I mean, everybody I know in agriculture had better be trying to make a profit or you're not going to last very long. And even, like I said, even if you are, uh, and even if you're pretty smart about how you do it, you can still have a hard time making it work. So that's, that's my problem with the, the bill. Now, what was the bill trying to do? It wasn't trying to, it wasn't, it didn't, I don't, I don't believe it set out to insult agricultural production or people with water rights. But I think 
that what it set out to do was make it so that anybody not from Colorado uh, was prohibited from owning a water right here. And yeah. I think the reason they wanted that to be the case, well, the, the reason they wanted that to be the case is just a NIMBY type of thing, like not in my backyard. Right. Don't let those people, you know, it's fine that I came here uh, maybe from a different state or a different part of our state or, or a different country even, but I want to shut the door behind me. Nobody else should get to do what I did. And that, yeah, obviously that's a problem. You can't do that. Not, not only is that unconstitutional, like U S constitutional problem doing that. So they, 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 it's just a bad, that's bad policy, bad public policy in a democracy that's based the way ours is. So the way they they went about it was ham handed and and not not very effective at all uh, and and dangerous actually. Um, but it it they couldn't just come out and say that in the bill. They couldn't say, hey, no. if you're from New York or California or Texas, you can't have water. We don't water want you here. here anymore. Yeah, they they knew that that would run right up. Uh, against the constitution out of the get out of the gate and, and wouldn't go anywhere. So they tried to get clever with it and they made this whole thing about making a profit. And what I think they, they misunderstood is, uh, you know, probably a lot like the people down on 60th street mall, people are in agriculture, not because of the, well, maybe they're there because of the romance and, and, and the culture, uh, but they're also there to make a profit. And to criminalize, in this instance, a uh, profit motive, that's inherently against the capitalist market-based economy and structure that we have in our democratic republic. Like, that's, that, that doesn't work. So that's why it was dangerous um, to have that, because, uh, because it did run contrary to our system of government and in and democracy in our in our nation, uh, but it also it was dangerous because of the way they went about it. Right. They, they put this committee together, mm-hmm. and then and which is good. And when it was a good and committee, it was a well well rounded committee. It the, was a well rounded committee. Like I said, I wish they'd have put more agricultural people that actually own water rights. I think Joe Bernal and Joe Frank were the only two. Uh, the two farmers were the only two that actually owned water rights. The, the rest of them were, I'm sure, very smart people, just like me. There, but there were, you know, Travis were, Smith was on that, and a few others. So I know. Travis wasn't on it. Oh, he wasn't. I thought he was. Nope, nope. The only two farmers, the only two people from agriculture, were. Joe Bernal and Joe Frank. Huh. Those were the only two. So it could have been more well-rounded, but it would, but the people that were on it were smart. Yeah. And they listened to Joe and Joe. They listened to him go, Hey, hold on a second. This whole thing is being cooked up because somebody's afraid of somebody owning a bunch of water in the Grand Valley or Eastern Plains or wherever. That's not happening. In fact, some of our best producers are not from Colorado. Uh, I'd love this. I'm a fifth generation Coloradan, but I'm not from Colorado. My people are from Norway and Sweden. I was going to say just about everybody's not from Colorado. If you're going to be that. Yeah. Unless you're my good friend, Ernest house uh, junior and you're from, you're a Ute. Yep. I was going to say Ute or Southern Ute. The native. You're not from here. So don't give me this line that, Oh, well only certain people, if you're from here can own water. Cause that's, I guarantee that that committee that put this stuff together, put that bill out there, they're not from Colorado. Their people are not you Indians. Correct. So I'm, I'm a, I get a little bit irked at the insinuation that, well, if you're, if, if you're, uh, if you're from somewhere else, then get out. Cause if that would have been the rule in 1888, when my, my great, great grandparents rolled in here, they wouldn't have been able to own their place because exactly. guess what? They were in it to make a profit. That was the system. That was the country they had moved to. And well, well, to tell them, you, yeah, you can move over here and you can even use the water. But the minute you start making a profit with that water, you're done. Well, uh, and, They and would if, have said, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't do this. This doesn't work. If we were going to do it that way, I would um, 
my family's precedent would supersede yours, both on my mother's side and my father's side, way before that we were even a state. So, I mean, it's a, it's that same argument. So let's finish on some solutions. We wanted we started at the beginning to talk about. Um, you alluded to the date, 2026, stuff that had been decided in 2019, 2026, yep. that's coming up. Um, and this was the part that got me really like, oh, <clears throat> about about all this. So let's talk solutions and... Um, yeah. No, that's let, good. Let's, uh, let's finish it's, with it's that. True. Uh, that. That was probably my, my third point on Senate Bill 29, just to wrap it up, is that instead of debating what we're going to talk about right now, the solutions that are available in a crisis, we were debating this baloney about, about whether or not I intend to make a profit right. off of, off of my water, which is ridiculous. You better be if you're in agriculture, but anyway, yeah. uh, that, 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 that was my, instead we should have been talking about solutions. We should have had those geniuses on that task force. And the, some of them are really, they really are, know, they are really smart. Joe Bernal, Joe yeah. Frank, I want those guys dealing with the solutions. I want them debating the real issues in water, not spinning their wheels for an entire year, driving to meetings and doing Zoom calls on a topic that has absolutely the potential to be uh, catastrophic to the way we do water in Colorado right. and the West. But so, so what are those solutions? Like I said at the start, Pal and Mead are are falling really quickly, uh, have fallen very quickly, and are projected to continue to fall, uh, maybe even more rapidly. And that means that we need uh, solutions to that problem. Well, what are they? Well, one is, uh, and we're already doing this one, uh, you just push it as much water as you can out of the upper reservoirs that sit up above Lake Powell down to it. So you take water out of Flaming Gorge, out of the Aspinall unit, out of Navajo, and you push that water down to Lake Powell to keep it propped up uh, so that it doesn't go below minimum power pool. There's all the modeling I've seen suggests that's not going to be enough. So what else could we do? Well, what we could do is we could do something called demand management. Well, what's that? Well, it's managing your demands. And that means in in the municipal context, that means putting in more efficient, uh, more efficiencies that actually save water, like we've been talking about. In the agricultural context, though, it means following land. And that's possible to do if you're raising a cash crop that's a row crop or something like that. But if your cash crop is, um, is uh, Palisade peaches mm. or... Uh, you're, you're, you're running an orchard of some kind. You can't fallow trees for a year. The trees will die and then you won't have any crop to come back to next year. So you can't fallow an orchard, but there are classes of crops that you can fallow for a year. And then you can, there might be some uh, recovery that you have to build in uh, to a high mountain hay pasture or something like that the next year that you do irrigate it. But right now, it's, um, uh, you know, it's possible to follow it in, in a given year and get it back, you know, next year. So if you do that, you leave the water in the river. And if you leave the water in the river and it goes down to Lake Powell, that's something that if it's done at scale, could influence this problem. It could solve uh, part of the problem. The other part of the problem, so it, it's a supply and demand problem, right? Um, most Mostly on the demand side. The, the supply side, we can do very little about. We can do a little cloud seeding, uh, and, and that helps around them, maybe around the edges, around the margins. Um, we can do, um, you know, a little bit better on how we manage our forest health and that kind of thing to keep more of the snowpack shaded instead of evaporating at altitude. Um, but for the most part, it's our demands where most of our gains are going to come from. And so managing those demands is kind of a no brainer to me. That said, we have water users in Colorado who don't agree that demand management is a good idea. They think, well, demand management might mean that I fallow my land and I get paid to do that. By the way, that's critical. You have to be paid to 
fallow your land because you're not producing a crop that year. And if you're not producing a crop that year, you're not making the money that you otherwise would have realized. So you need to be paid in order to leave this water in the river and, and help the PAL situation. And there are people that say, well, if you pay farmers and ranchers to do that, well, they're just going to leave the profession and you're going to have a buy and dry situation where they just get out of the, they just get out of business altogether. And, you know, you're sensing a theme from me, Sarah and Brian. I don't like it when people uh, disrespect or um, take for granted uh, agricultural producers' intelligence. We <laughs> like, agree. Think, yeah. We could not agree with you more. It's it's I, funny when somebody tries to armchair quarterback um, ag producers. You, it, it, yeah, it, it's like it's just, give me a break. How like, how dumb do it. can you be? Yeah, it it it, uh, it doesn't it doesn't make sense, and it's just wrong. So, um, the the people that are out there are saying no, demand management is going to make this buy and dry problem worse. I just don't agree with. Uh, I I think demand management actually will make the buy and dry problem uh, will help us not do as much buy and dry in our state because you'll give agricultural producers more flexibility because they won't have to go, you know, that year when they might not have bought seed and put it in the ground anyway, because the market was terrible. Well, if they got to farm cash that year, that's great for them. They, they get more uh, flexibility to, uh, and this is where I get really giddy and excited is if you give, if you pay these folks um, for following uh, uh, their ground for a year, the next year when they come back armed with that cash that they had the opportunity to invest in either new equipment, invest in the market and get a return on, invest somewhere to do something, they are going to come back stronger and more productive than the year that they went into that problem. And that, and, and so what's that, that allow them to do that, that flexibility and that, that new capital allows them to do what it allows them to move toward things like regenerative agriculture. Right. It allows them to start banking carbon in their soils and thereby growing their soil as a, and their soil health as opposed to turning it into dirt and desertification is what we call it. When you just take all the nutrients, all the, all the, uh, the fungi and the bacteria are sucked out of the soil or killed uh, by some sort of pesticide or something, that's turning your ground into dirt. That's turning soil into dirt. And what we need to be doing in the Western U.S. and what we used to do is turning dirt into soil. And you can do that if you do some pretty, and we're learning more about this stuff every day, every hour, it seems, uh, how, to, how to do this better and better. But you can, you can do that in, uh, in the agricultural, you know, in, in farming and in ranching, how you graze your cows can help sequester carbon in soil. And that that's what we should be laser focused on to address this whole climate change issue. And, and uh, it, it's real, it's meaningful, but guess what? Some of the people that might uh, benefit from such a program, well, maybe they, maybe they uh, voted for Donald Trump or maybe they voted uh, the, uh, different from the way somebody wanted, the, you know, wanted them to vote. And, and, and I, I, I fear, I hope it's not the case, but I fear that people are saying, well, we don't want people who didn't vote the way we thought they should uh, to benefit from a program like that. So we're, we're just not going to create the program at all. We're not going to have demand management in Colorado because that would pay people who uh, don't think the way we do. And I, that's just massive folly. Uh, it's not good for our democracy. It's not good for the policy. And it doesn't do anything to address the actual problem. If climate change is as bad as we say it is, and I'm right up there uh, among the top of, you know, people from kind of my side of the political spectrum that, that say that it's a very big deal and a very big problem, um, 
then we've got to start acting like it. You know, uh, the 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 uh, activist from Sweden, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, said it. I thought pretty well. If if our house is on fire, we should act like our house is on fire. It doesn't do us any good to say the house is on fire, and then we walk around like business as usual. Like if it's on fire, we got to put that fire out. And the way you put the fire out is, in this instance, by sequestering carbon at scale. Guess who owns more land than anybody else in the country? Farmers and ranchers. That's who. So what you're saying is you would like to see um, the people who are actually doing the work be incentivized for motivation or for innovation and um, doing it a better job because, you know, they've been in it for a while and yep. they might know what they're doing, but um, yeah. this seems a little this seems a little revolutionary, James. That you would say um, help not hurt our farmers. Yeah, well, there. Like I said, I think it goes back to this misunderstanding or just ignorance of the actual reality, which is farmers and ranchers. Uh, they might be continuing a legacy or they might be getting into it brand new, but they're not getting into it to make less money. They're not getting into it for a nonprofit motive. They're in it because it, it works. If you do it well, you can make some money doing it. And in a democratic democracy that has a market-based capitalism as its economic system, that should be a good thing. Yeah. And so we should harness that instead of trying to fight it uh, and turn it into something that is not, you know, we, we should, we should be, we should be harnessing that capability. And that's my argument. Like I said, I love having these debates and I love having them in, uh, in an academic context with students who are like the people I described, they don't know about agriculture. And that's part of the issue too, guys, is that, you know, the hundred legislators under our gold dome in Colorado, maybe, maybe 10 yeah. are from Actual rural parts of the state. Yeah. Yeah, we, and, we've and that's that. generous. I think most of <laughs> I them, I, I, I only know Cle- Senator Cleve Simpson is the only one I know that actually owns a water right out of all the people under that gold dome. Wow. And that's a total difference than if you went back to the 1960s or maybe even like the 1970s and you went to that legislative body a lot of them, I would I would argue the vast majority of them would have some touch point with rural Colorado, with agriculture. Maybe they grew up on a farm. Maybe their parents grew up on a farm. Maybe they've got siblings that are farming or ranching. Maybe they've got uh, a business, an agribusiness that connects with agriculture in Colorado. Um, but you would have had those, connect, the, those points of connection. And Whatever. we've lost those because – you know, our system is is population based. Both chambers of our legislature are population based, right? So we don't have the dynamic that you have in the U.S. Congress with the Senate being equal representation, no matter how many people live in your in your district. Uh, we've got it so that only population uh, drives new districts, right? right. So. Um, we, we've got a lot more people from the urban sector, and that's fine. I've got no problem. I live around those people. I'm one of them. I live in Denver, uh, so I get it. But we've got to educate them. That's where your uh, organization, Action 22, that's where Club 20, Pro 15, that's where the Farm Bureau and the Cattlemen's Association and uh, uh, Colorado Water Congress and, you know, a, a all the groups that deal day in and day out with issues that impact rural Colorado. Really, I, I would love to see some sort of a, a clearinghouse or a, a place where they could be brought together. The, 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 those organizations could all kind of cooperate and work together to educate the people that make our laws uh, about how it actually works. Because if you if you really explained it to those hundred legislators under the dome, in in a way that they could uh, appreciate and understand, you know, this is how it works, and here's 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 why it's kind of disastrous to 
to criminalize making a profit. Uh, if you explained it to them, I think they would make better policy, better laws, at, at least vis-a-vis the rural parts of the state. Yep. And, and that, that's, that's, uh, I guess, I guess that's where I would, I would go with, uh, uh, you know, and I know that's why you do the work you do. Uh, both of you put in the time and the effort to do things like this, that, um, that are here. And the reason you do it is because you believe in, in the ability of the different, different people from different walks of life with different perspective, all joining hands and actually doing something that's productive for the entire state. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see you guys and, and operating as a catalyst in this way. And I don't want to, short i don't want to not answer any questions that you had but uh uh i I, you've given me a chance to give you my kind of my take on all this (laughs) so interestingly enough um i have three thoughts uh closing up here one is if you go back to the buy and dry that this this program something like this would cause farmers just to like close shop and quit so my family, my extended family, owns a lot of farmland in Kansas. Um, they've been there since the, the 1800s. Um, growing up, you hit 13 years old, my dad would send us to the farm, and I had to work on the farm and you know do, learn how it worked. But CRP, right? Um, yeah. They, they all went through, and I'm, I'm talking like 20 family members, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins. They all went through the CRP and took the funding. They did not close any of their farms. They're actively farming to this day and they benefited from the CRP funding on that. Um, So I I just don't buy it. I'm with you. I I don't think that would shut down. And what did they do? They, um, they got new tractors. They invested in infrastructure. They invested in baking and made a lot of money off of that too, which in turn went to the farm afterwards. Um, And then the, just getting people to understand it. So when I first started working for the Senate, um, federal Senate, uh, first weekend they give me understanding water law and it was the layman's version of water law which was like a 400 page book you know and it was required for all staff in the western states working for senators to read that book and that's how i i got into it and got to know like how it worked to a point and you know on the federal side you have staff that know on the state side you don't really have that and i would love to see Every state legislator read the book that I have. I think it's on the shelf here back at home. Say like, right when you go in, you need to read this because it's all based on Colorado water law. Um, And then, and then with that, uh, one thing that we're doing is we're putting together uh, an Academy an action 22 leadership policy and government Academy for this reason. And as we're getting this together, we'll follow up with you, but it's going to be a crash course on how it actually works at a state level here in Colorado and more details to come on that, but it's exactly what you described. We're, we're targeting a six month course leadership class. You start, you learn it up and down inside and out. And by the time you go through this course, six months later, you will have a very good understanding how everything works, not only from the rural side, understanding, you know, how Denver works, but we want to attract the Denver side or that we'll say the, um, the urban side, to come in yeah. and use this class as basically kind of a, a handshake between the urban and rural Colorado and the legislators and the up and coming legislators and leaders and policymakers. So that's, that's one cool thing we're Local working on government now. And, yeah. That's top notch. That's, uh, that, that's just music to my ears. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you guys are, and I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't expect anything less uh, <laughs> from, from you. I, James, I see so you at the, sweet. At, you, you're always engaged. You're always thinking about the next uh, way to make uh, our conversations in this state better and, uh, and produce better policy and law that allows us to all, you know, realize the Colorado we want our kids and grandkids to inherit. So uh, you're doing the good work. And I, I, uh, I'm always, always appreciative of, uh, getting to talk with you. So, well, thanks uh, James. We appreciate it. You're a beautiful nerd. We appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> you're the, one of the people that's uh, out there on this water, 
on this water issue. Um, and y- from the very beginning, you're the one that I've, I've gone to to ask all of these questions because you're patient with, with me about it as I learn it. And there, it never fails that I learn something when I interact with you. So with that, we're going to conclude. Um, hey, Chad Vorthman, I know you're listening. Uh, how did that grab you on all of the water issues? And James laughing because he knows exactly who you are and what we're talking about on the, all of this. And um, it was a really impressive uh ELA that was put on by you guys and where you're having the ag um, leaders uh, have these discussions. And that's what we alluded to a little bit um, later. Um, If you're not already a member of Action 22, you need to be a member. That way you have direct access to people like James Eklund, um, that you can be a part of the voice, that your influence goes up, that you can be a leader at the table with all the other leaders that are members of Action 22. If you um, have any questions about that, uh, email us at show at action22.org. Disclaimer. Action 22 does not support nor endorse candidates running for political office. All of our opinions on the show are of ours and not necessarily the views of our board and membership. And if you are a candidate or an incumbent and you want to come on the show, you just have to be an Action 22 member. We offer this as a platform for anybody that's running for office that's a member. So hit us up and you could come on and talk about anything and everything you want to. Thanks again to James Eklund for being with us and we will see you guys next week. Thanks. Thanks, guys.